As a Western Christian who has long studied, taught, and written about orthodoxy, I have often pointed out that orthodoxy asks different questions of the scriptural and patristic witness than Western Christianity does. And yet, when you ask different questions, you get different answers. That affords a way into appreciating, as a Western Christian, the rich faithfulness of orthodoxy to what St. Jude described as the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints in verse 3. That entree opens up a magnificent panorama of Eastern Christian teaching, practice, and worship to explore, as I've done in my own teaching and with my own classes. Today, though, I want to dig a bit more deeply than recognizing different questions and answers. This paper will consider Phineas Clodden's quid, faith-seeking what? paper will consider four things, the fourth very briefly. First, the providence of and significance of a particular Latin phrase, not that one, it'll come up in a minute, which functions as a common assumption Western Christians carry to the study of theology. Then I lay out why and how that assumption doesn't fit with Eastern Christian approaches. Then number two, I will show how that assumption also has shaped Western Christian approaches to the history of Christian doctrine. Following that, third, I will point out how leading Orthodox scholars have differed in their approach to that study. And finally, then, I'll propose a variation of the Latin phrase which could serve as a viable alternative description for an Orthodox approach to the study of the history of Christian doctrine. So first, then, studying theology. In Western Christianity... The phrase fides quaerens intellectum, faith seeking understanding, has long served as the main rationale for theological study and teaching. The phrase was first used by Anselm, who became uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, in the late 11th century. He wrote it. The phrase was uh, he intended to adopt as the title for the book in which he laid out his ontological proof for the existence of God, one of his many con- main contributions to theology. However, he ended up changing that title to proslogion, and the specific phrase itself, Fides Quadens Intellectum, only appeared near the end of his preface before the future Archbishop of Canterbury embarked on that ontological argument. Anselm scholars have recognized how profoundly Augustine of Hippo's teaching had influenced Anselm. While the specific phrase he used, Fides Quadens Intellectum, was not itself, as far as I've been able to discover in any event, used by Augustine, The orientation the phrase lays out fits so well with the Bishop of Hippo's views that it has often been appropriated to describe his perspective. Without question, Anselm's phrase, Fides Quirens Intellectum, offered a condensed version of the directive Augustine gave when he advised in his commentary on the Gospel of John, Correra ut intelligas, believe so that you may understand. More fully, do not seek to understand in order to believe, but believe so that you may understand. The closeness of Anselm's reliance on Augustine in this regard is evident in the virtual word-for-word repetition of Augustine's statement at the end of chapter 1 of Proslogion, where Anselm writes, Nequa enim quaero intelligere ut credam, sed credo ut intelligam. So do not seek to understand in order to believe, but believe in order to understand. Given the overwhelming influence of Augustine of Hippo within Western Christianity ever since antiquity, and the undoubted impact of Anselm of Canterbury as the father of scholasticism in medieval Western Christendom, the phrase fides quaerens intellectum has a hoary and revered resonance for all of Western Christianity across the perspectival spectrum from conservative to liberal viewpoints. Fides quaerens intellectum serves as a one-size-fits-all garment worn by Western Christian approaches to theology. Now, I realize fully well the beginning of paper for an Eastern Christian audience by citing Augustine of Hippo and Anselm of Canterbury will seem odd. Orthodoxy is hardly warmed to Anselm. The penal substitutionary atonement theory he expounded in Cor Deus Homo, Why God Became Human, expanded on the rudimentary legal and juridical orientations which had grown up and become dominant within medieval Western Christianity. And Anselm's book squarely situated the accomplishment of salvation within the feudal law structure that dominated Western Europe in his time. His conception of the atonement has definitively shaped Western Christian understandings of that atonement down to the present day, when feudal law has long since disappeared. It is hardly surprising that Anselm of Canterbury has had little value for orthodoxy, except perhaps to serve as a bad example. And to cite Augustine on top of that, 
The Bishop of Hippo has been accorded only an awkward welcome in orthodoxy, as my own students recognized in the course pack of patristic readings I prepared for their use in an upper-level church history course. They said, Augustine is doing something different than the other church fathers. His confidence in sanctified human reason to find examples in creation that would adequately reflect the Trinity on the one hand, and his readiness to expound the relationship of predestination, grace, and free will on the other, to name no further examples, put him in an awkward relationship with the rest of the church fathers. It is hardly surprising to me as a Western Christian that studies have appeared examining the uneasy relationship between Eastern Christianity and the Bishop of Hippo, or that Orthodox folks may be ready to refer to him as Blessed Augustine, but hesitate to call him Saint Augustine. Yet this helps make the first point I need to establish in this paper. The phrase commonly used to describe the theological quest in Western Christianity, a phrase associated so closely with these two figures, has no particular resonance in orthodoxy, but not just because of its provenance. Fides Quirin's intellectum serves admirably as a rationale and description of that quest within Western Christianity in the main. Even the mysteries, to use the orthodox designation of baptism in the Eucharist, fall within its scope. Within Western Christendom, explanations laying out how the sacraments work in ostensibly comprehensible waves abound, not only in Roman Catholicism, but also across the wide spectrum constituting the Protestant world today, even though, to be sure, those explanations are not curiously in any sort of agreement. So Fides Quirin's intellectum resonates within Western Christian theologizing for the most part. To be sure, it founders when one tries to relate it to the mystical traditions of Western Christianity, whether those of Meister Eckhart or Julian of Norwich or John of the Cross or more recently Thomas Merton. Something else, pastoral, devotional, contemplative, is going on here than answering intellectual questions. And those mystical approaches are, for the most part, left to the side as Western Christian theology otherwise lauds its fides quirens intellectum orientation. But with Orthodoxy's perspectives on theology, Fides Quirin's intellectum can have, and historically has had, minimal significance. Given the suspicion of even sanctified human reason to deal with the wonders of God, of who God is and how God relates to us, as repeatedly articulated by a host of Greek church fathers, emphasizing a quest for understanding would seem foolish. Of course, with cataphatic, with positive theology, we are summoned to present as clearly as we humbly can, what the faithful should believe about God and God's ways toward us. Within that limited scope, pursuing understanding is necessary. But positive theology is always and only propodeutic to apophatic or negative theology, which deliberately seeks to go beyond what can be understood and enter into the blinding light of divine darkness and intimate communion in the divine energies, as Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory Palamas and others have urged. In apophatic theology, Fides Quirin's intellectum has no purchase. And since negative theology is the highest form of theology, it is not surprising that the phrase which has so significantly shaped Western Christian approaches to the study of theology has no significance for an orthodox approach. That is not to say, of course, that in orthodoxy there is no pursuit, no seeking, as Eastern Christians do theology. But Fides Quirin's intellectum will not serve to describe that endeavor. Might it serve, though, to describe an orthodox approach to the study of the history of Christian doctrine? To turn toward that question, we will consider how that study has been approached in Western Christianity. So, second point, studying the history of Christian doctrine. I'm not putting the points on here. I'm just going to have the Latin phrases and their variations there. So, second point of the four is studying the history of Christian doctrine. The careful examination of the history of Christian doctrine is a relative newcomer to the pantheon of theological studies. Christian leaders had long valued the study of the ancient languages in which scripture was written. In antiquity, Origen and Jerome contributed significantly in these regards, and others have followed in subsequent centuries. That's not new. Similarly, apologetical works, catechetical instruction, and teaching about doctrine are found from the time of the apologists in the second century onward. Justin Martyr, Cyril of Jerusalem and John of Damascus all deserve mention, not because they were alone in their work, but because they gave stimulus to and have found uh, 
resonance in so many other Christian leaders over ensuing centuries. Concern for pastoral guidance also has flourished in the time since the works written by John Chrysostom and Pope Gregory the Great on that, on that field. But the history of Christian teaching waited long for its entry into theological studies. Now, of course, Christians have always recognized both that the Christian faith is profoundly rooted in history and also that times have passed as we move toward the culmination of that history in the parousia. But the notion of anachronism, essential to the scholarly study of history, the sense of historical distance, that something is out of place if claimed in a particular earlier historical period, that sense of anachronism only found its birth in the late 14th and early 15th centuries with the Italian Renaissance, and especially in the works of Francesco Petrarca and Giovanni Boccaccio. The startling awareness transformed the view of the past, making room for historical criticisms of the what is of that time, claiming that status quo in the name of a bygone, challenging that status quo rather, in the name of a bygone golden age. The sense of historical anachronism ended up transforming the way people viewed the world. The is of their day was not a manifestation of timeless purpose, even if tainted by sin, but a contingent development shaped by many influences and factors. Seeking out how things had changed and become what they were emerged as a significant passion of the intellectual world as Eastern Europe, Europe moved into the early modern, as Western Europe, pardon me, moved into the early modern era. But in short order, Western civilization entered the age of the Enlightenment, a period when historic Christianity found itself under criticism and felt itself under serious assault. But given the conflicts among Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, the Reformed, and Anglicanism, it is perhaps not surprising that many churchmen chafed at the notion that their particular views were not simply and straightforwardly what all true Christians had in their deepest hearts always believed. Even so, in the face of the wealth of data that became available through critical editions of the Church Fathers, which had been published since the early 16th century by Erasmus and many other people, Roman Catholic and Protestant alike, this perspective managed almost always to remain the default position in Western Christianity through the 17th century and well into the 18th also. But by the 19th century, critical study of the history of Christian teaching emerged. It reckoned with differences in terminology used by various church fathers, arguments within the early church and subsequently, and the undeniably anachronistic ways Western Christians of all stripes had appropriated Christian antiquity for their respective groups. The study found a striking presentation in the remarkable work by John Henry, later Cardinal Newman, entitled An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine, first published in 1845. In that, he described an evolution of Christian doctrine entailing transitions and developments from early Christian sources, both in quality, that is, more elaborate statements, and an evolution in quantity, adding declarations of what had been germinally present but not declared in the original apostolic deposit. Newman's views on doctrinal development caused some consternation when he was received from Anglicanism into the Roman Catholic Church, to be sure. But they have become common and now much more detailed teaching within the Roman Communion in the 20th and 21st centuries. Fides Quirens Intellectum, serves now to describe well how the study of the history of Christian doctrine is conducted in Roman Catholicism. Within the Protestant world, from the mid-19th century onward, scholars across a spectrum of viewpoints treated the history of Christian doctrine from the vantage point of the development of doctrine. In virtually every instance, that development played itself out as fides quirens intellectum. This is easy to see on the liberal side. As the most obvious example, we can cite the undeniably brilliant dogma historical studies and publications of Adolf von Harnack, who lived 1851 to 1930. As is well known, his view of what transpired in the ancient church was a movement from a simple, uh, from a simple presentation of good news announcing the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man to a Hellenized, philosophically more refined development of Christian teaching. In this regard, faith sought a polished, intellectually compelling articulation of Christian faith, which could stand comparison with the philosophies of Hellenistic intellectual culture. This was clearly not what the apostles had proclaimed, 
Faith seeking had led to an understanding hardly commensurate with the apostolic prototype. On the conservative side, Reinhold Saber, who lived 1859 to 1935, can stand as, as an example of a dogma historian for whom Fides Quaerens intellectum in the ancient church entailed a development from more primitive apostolic proclamation via controversies to greater depths of insight and understanding which afforded an enrichment and further construction of the teaching offered by the apostles. In this he was followed in the main by James Orr with his The Progress of Dogma, was the title of the work, published in 1901. Now it's significant for our purposes today that Orr urged that the Christian faith has a definite content which it is the task of the church to defend and proclaim. In the course of doing so through the centuries, Orr averred, an evolution in dogma, a genuine progress in theology had taken place. Specifically, he declared a deeper and more complete understanding of Christianity arose than had previously been enjoyed, carrying it, Christian doctrine, a stage towards, as he put it, a stage further towards completion. He discerned this progress as closely aligned with the loci of systematic theology as that discipline had developed. Following in Orr's footsteps, Louis Burkhoff forthrightly declared, quote, we can discern a certain logical necessity in the successive stages of the development of each dogma and in the order in which the various dogmatical problems presented themselves. In general, it may be said that the logical order usually followed in the study of dogmatics is reflected more or less in the history of dogma, end quote. Now, inasmuch as this loci approach to theology is not a common orthodox practice, it may be helpful for me here to note those successive stages according to which the development of Christian doctrine or the progress of dogma transpired, according to this, this approach. Following the course of doctrinal controversies, that order is, first, the doctrine of God is Trinity, the doctrine of Christ as Savior, both divine and human, but one person, then the doctrines of sin and grace, building on Augustine in his responses to Pelagius, then the doctrine of soteriology, accom uh, soteriology accomplished, building on the penal substitutionary atonement theory of Anselm, and soteriology applied, building on the teachings of the Protestant reformers, including their respective positions on the reception of the sacraments. Now this is what Western Christian scholars, whether liberal or conservative in orientation, typically present in their treatments of the history of Christian doctrine. Different as their respective assessments may be, though, the development they discern is one in which Fides Quadens intellectum has led to an understanding that was deeper, more profound and searching than what the church, than what the church, including the apostles themselves, had previously known. Building on the antiquity shared with Eastern Christianity, these studies of doctrinal history have proceeded into the medieval period of Western Christendom and followed it through the explosive tensions of the Protestant Reformation to the present. In these treatments, the history of Christian doctrine always develops into deeper understanding, enabling more facile compre comprehension of the full ramifications of the faith, once for all entrusted to the saints. Now, I recognize that these histories of Christian doctrine focus on Western Christianity. The purpose for discussing them, even this briefly, has not been to suggest that they should somehow be significant for orthodoxy. Rather, my concern is to point out how Fides Quirin's intellectum has manifested itself in the ways Western Christian scholars have expounded that history and not just their approach to theology. With an awareness of how this history has been carried forward beyond Christian antiquity in Western Christian scholarship, we're now in a better position to recognize and assess how that scholarship has dealt with what transpired during the patristic era shared with West Eastern Christianity. According to that scholarship, in Christian, Christian antiquity, what faith sought, fides quirens, during the Trinitarian and Christological controversies that racked the church in the first eight centuries, was deeper and greater understanding, intellectual. The progress of Christian theology, as, it's been, as they assert it, allegedly moved from the apostles' teachings to more sophisticated doctrines, which came to expression in the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, 
and in the definition of faith of the Council of Chalcedon. However, this is not the pattern I have found as I've studied Orthodox scholars who deal with those ancient controversies. The phrase, fides quietens intellectum, as followed in Western Christian scholarship on those controversies, does not fit. I hope to present a parallel phrase that might work in due course as point number four. But before going further, it would be beneficial to give greater specificity to some terms we've already been using because they can blend into each other. One of them is history. It's undeniable that there is a history of Christian doctrine, at least in the sense that we can follow out the story of how controversies took place, who participated in them, how they expressed their views. And we can recognize that various participants wrote and spoke in ways that were not simply identical with the writing and speaking of others. So to speak of the history of Christian doctrine in this sense did not cause concern. There is such a history. Another important term is development. Undoubtedly, the stories of these controversies move through stages, so there is development in that sense, which again need raise no concern. That these stages led to modifications in terminology need not be suspect either. Such development can find alternative terms or concise expressions which capture the original apostolic message aptly and address the issues in question in the controversy. In another sense, though, development can be problematic if it leads to a view that the original apostolic message morphed into something different from or in addition to what the apostles had proclaimed. Finally, among these terms, to speak of progress is mostly exceptionable. While it would be appropriate to speak of progress in dealing with a controversy, that is, moving toward a resolution of it, the term is more commonly used in the studies of the history of Christian doctrine to denote a movement beyond the original apostolic message toward an enhanced and enriched status, which itself is a step toward yet further progress. In that sense, in, in this sense, progress is objectionable from an orthodox perspective. Now, it would be fatuous to look for orthodox treatments of the history of Christian doctrine with the historical sweep of 21 centuries that's marked its treatment in the Christian West. For orthodoxy, the history of Christian doctrine attained its peak with the restoration of icons in 843. In the Eastern Christian calendar year, that event is celebrated on the first Sunday of Lent as the triumph of orthodoxy. With the restoration of the decisions of the Seventh Ecumenical Council of 787, Eastern Christianity confesses that the fullness of orthodoxy has been defended. The reassertion of its horos, declaring the legitimacy of icons as a way of confessing the genuine incarnation of the Son of God, has marked for the orthodox the victory in the final controversy over the Savior. Orthodoxy has triumphed. After that, no further development or no further controversy is expected or confessed. Only proclamation or defense of the Orthodox faith is warranted. Sometimes that proclamation could be in renewed, form, in renewed piety, as with Simeon, the new theologian, or it could be in defense of ancient practices of prayer, as with Gregory Palamas and Hesychasm. But neither of these movements or their recognized spokesmen added to the orthodoxy which had triumphed in an Eastern Christian understanding with the restoration of icons in 843. So in what we consider below, what we consider now following, about an orthodox view of the history of Christian doctrine, we'll be restricting our considerations to the Trinitarian and Christological controversies that led to the decisions and declarations of the seven ecumenical councils. <coughs> As we enter now into these considerations, it's important to note how two of the four Orthodox scholars whose treatments we will review address the question mooted by the Western Christian assertion of the development of doctrine. These can both be found handily in the early pages of the first vol volume of John Baer's study of the history of Christian theology that begins, it's called The Formation of Christian Theology, The Way to Nicaea, and then uh, two parts of volume two of the, the Nicene Faith. But in the first forwards, uh, these can both be found in the early pages of that first volume. In the forward to that volume, that forward written by Andrew Louth, Louth observes, quote, most orthodox are critical of the development of theology in the West, in particular, 
the way theology had developed as an academic discipline remote from the life of prayer. And yet the fruits of critical scholarship, which have led, among other things, to a rediscovery of the riches of the theology of the fathers, can hardly be ignored, end quote. This bifurcated assessment is soon followed by a more cautionary evaluation. He says, quote, The formation of Christian theology is not the development of Christian doctrine. Orthodox theologians ought to have more problems with that idea than they seem to. We can never pass beyond the apostolic profession of Christ, end quote. From his perspective as he introduces the careful and critical historical study that follows in the volume by Bear, Professor Louth urges Orthodox scholarship to renewed clarity as to its vision and its approach to the history of Christian doctrine. For himself, in the introduction to that first volume, John Bear indicates that this study, to be carried forward in subsequent volumes up to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, several volumes are still to be written, quote, that his study, quote, does not present, as did the grand histories of dogma, an overarching narrative of theological development, end quote. Agreeing with Louth's appreciation for critical patristic scholarship, Baer comments in a way significant for our investigations today, quote, the prolific scholarship of the early church over the last century has meant that more attention had been given to understanding earlier writers on their own terms rather than as stages on the way to later landmarks, such as Nicaea and Chalcedon. Unless the process of reflection on the gospel, let's say that again, unless the process of reflection on the gospel which led to Nicaea and Chalcedon is grasped, any statements of faith, such counsels formulated, will not be adequately understood. End quote. Soon thereafter, he opens up what his research has pointed to when he states, quote, what we will find in the Father studied here its reflection on and within the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the transformation of the primitive gospel into Greek metaphysics, the development of something not there from the beginning, but is rather the deepening understanding of what is given once and for all, end quote. So now turning thirdly to Orthodox scholars in the history of Christian doctrine. What I considered from Baron Louth was just introductory on the question of history and development of doctrine. Look at this in three ways. Irenaeus of Lyon serves as a good orientation point for our investigation of how Orthodox scholars deal with the history of Christian doctrine. First, he urged strongly that the apostolic tradition had been faithfully passed down from the apostles through the leaders of the church. He does that in numerous places and against heresies. Secondly, his claim in this regard was personal, or not secondly, but his, his claim in this regard was personal, taught by Polycarp himself. Polycarp had been taught by St. John the Evangelist, so Irenaeus was the spiritual grandson of the apostle, one step removed from the apostle. Secondly, Irenaeus affirmed that the genuine Christianity passed on from the apostles down to his own day was presented in what he called the rule or canon of truth. The fact that he offered in his magnum opus against heresies a written account of that rule in two verbally different but conceptually overlapping versions shows that this rule was not so much a matter of precise words mechanically memorized and transmitted as a pattern of setting forth the apostolic message in a recognizably coherent package of teaching. Finally, and for our purposes perhaps most importantly, he emphasized that the apostles had received, quote, complete knowledge or perfect knowledge, end quote, of the Christian message. As he declared this, Irenaeus was rejecting the claims of his Gnostic opponents to have further or deeper or more significant understanding of, that full tr of the full truth than the apostles had received. His counterclaim was, of course, a denial of their bold declaration, but it was more than just a rejoinder, an argumentative one to their assertion. His claim laid a foundation for Christian reflection far beyond the particulars of the Gnostic menace in his day. When Irenaeus declared that the apostles had received complete knowledge, he was not asserting that they had thorough familiarity with the wide range of mathematical and medicinal learning attained by his day, or that they had insights into the complexities of thermonuclear science or molecular biology as explored in ours. 
His was a more modest but still ultimately bold claim that the apostles had received after the resurrection of Christ and the gift of the Spirit the whole of the truth involved in the Christian message. Their insights could not be improved on by the vagaries of Gnostic ruminations and teachings. The apostles had received the complete package of what God intended to communicate about the Savior and what he had done. Irenaeus' assertions did not preclude variations in terminology, as his own versions of the rule of faith demonstrated. They differed from each other in wording. The variations between them, and then in a third rendition that he offered in on the apostolic preaching, where he called, called the, that message the rule of faith, or the canon of faith, instead of the canon of truth, the variations among these three versions pointed out what the apostles had received and had handed on to others, who had then passed it on to others down to Irenaeus' day. And he claimed that anyone who went anywhere to a church founded by any one of the apostles would find the same teaching. Having noted his Gnostic opponent's teachings could only be found in scattered locales, Irenaeus declared, quote, But the path of those belonging to the church circumscribes the whole world. Since the church possesses the true tradition from the apostles, she thus enables us to see that the faith of is of all is one and the same, end quote. Irenaeus' assertions set the parameters within which orthodox scholarship has laid out its understanding of the history of Christian doctrine. Clearly, there had been a history of Christian teaching, according to Irenaeus, with the apostolic tradition being handed down from one generation of Christian leaders to the next. That history encountered a new phase, as Irenaeus found it necessary, to challenge and expose Gnostic teachings as unfaithful to the original apostolic message. Nothing in Irenaeus' writings suggested that he thought his opponents would be the last to walk this fateful path. And as the course of the ancient controversies unfolded in the centuries up to the Seventh Ecumenical Council indicate, others who would end up being denounced as heretics, those who had broken from the Christian faith, would take a similar path. There would be a development of teaching as leaders within the church sought to find ways of identifying and opposing aberrant views. Among other such developments, terms would be considered, discussed, and either rejected or accepted as helpful in continuing to present the apostolic message as it had been received and transmitted. Among these were, as you know, usia, essentia, substantia, hypostasis, prosopon, personae, and homoousias. None of the defenders of the church's tradition urged that these terms added to or offered further development of apostolic teaching. Rather, they served as convenient summaries of and defenses for the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. These defenders were not seeking better understanding. They were seeking terms that would shut out and preclude the various misunderstandings that these defenders had resisted in the controversies. These ancient doctrinal controversies were tangled affairs with much imperial and ecclesiastical intrigue, synods and counter-synods, parties for and against the teachers whose novelties had occasioned the strife, and of course much uncertainty ab among both clergy and laity as these controversies unfolded and taxed the strength of the church. But if we step out of the nitty-gritty of history down here on the ground and take a look from 10,000 meters at this controversial history, we can note a curious but notable pattern in the teachings of those who were ultimately condemned as heretics for having departed from the apostolic message. In each case, with the Gnostics, Sabellius, Arius, Apollinaris, Nestorius, Eutyches, and then the Monophysists, and the Monothelites, and the Iconoclasts, those who were ultimately rejected as having departed from the apostolic message had supposedly found a way to understand how the paradoxical elements of divine revelation could make sense to us. That is, each of them sought to understand how God the Father could have a son and remain one, or how the Son of God could become genuinely human, or how that incarnate Son could be both divine and human but still one person, or how that incarnate Son could be remembered. Now that observation, to be sure, has not been made with this degree of forthrightness by any Orthodox scholar who has written about these controversies. And I offer it here only in terribly broad strokes in order to give a background for what I've found in those Orthodox scholars' treatments. According to them, 
In each of these controversies, the defenders of the apostolic message sought to protect and clearly present nothing more than what was already included in the complete knowledge granted to the apostles. These Eastern Christian scholars have been perhaps polite enough not to assert what I as a Western Christian reluctantly need to acknowledge. Fides quietens intellectum, a phrase which, as we have seen, has had so much influence on the development of Western Christian approaches to the study of theology and of the history of the development of Christian doctrine, Fides Quietens Intellectum describes the approach of the heretics of Christian antiquity, not of the faithful. Now to consider four scholars whose works I want especially to point to in this regard. Andrew Louth, in his own work, not the introduction, the foreword, or the preface anymore. Pardon me, the foreword to Bears. Andrew Louth speaks carefully when he writes regarding the teachings embraced within orthodoxy as they've been defended by the seven ecumenical councils. Quote, dogma is important in the sense that there are matters about which it is important to be right. And then he says, or perhaps better, matters about which it is dangerous to be wrong. End quote. Since there is, quote, truth from God which can be defined, though definition in such matters is less a question of delineating something exactly than of preventing misunderstanding that is all too easy, end quote. Subsequently, as he surveys the long history of controversies that led to the ecumenical councils, he observes, quote, the long and complex story might rather be regarded as an account of the efforts by the church to avoid a series of misunderstandings of a faith expressed primarily in worship and prayer, but easily misconceived, in concepts and philosophical categories, end quote. Wath acknowledges that the controversies led the church to adopt terminology which could better express the faith. And he says this, in quote, quote, in order to achieve clarity, the church came to adopt a technical language. We need to be clear about what kind of clarity was sought. At no point did the church seek to solve the mystery of the Trinity, end quote or of Christology, which he mentions in the next paragraph. Mystery is to be honored, not explained. And again, quote, although the mysteries of the faith are beyond understanding, they are not beyond misunderstanding. And the conciliar definitions are intended to prevent such misunderstanding, end quote. This observation obtains also for the tangled controversial histories after the Council of Chalcedon, about which he says, quote, the succeeding complex history is perhaps best regarded as the series of ways of preventing various misunderstandings as to who Christ is. Indeed, this is perhaps the best way of understanding the achievement of the ecumenical councils as a whole, end quote. Luth, Luth acknowledges that this, the controversies passed through stages, but he rejects, quote, a false model of doctrinal development as if the doctrine of the Trinity is really later than the New Testament and the revelation of Christ, end quote. Louth refers instead to speak of realization of what was proclaimed in that revelation of, quote, realization rather than development, a growing clarity, not deeper insights, end quote. Alexander Schmemann, in his work, historical road of Eastern Orthodoxy, pointed out that for the entire course of these controversies, quote, the inner standard and criterion of theology was recognized to be the church's experience of salvation by Christ and in Christ, end quote. And that each of these terms, the term suggested to help with this was carefully assessed. Quote, in order to discover whether it revealed or in any way diminished the salvation, not the knowledge, the gospel proclaimed, end quote. These were neither abstract discussions seeking to satisfy this philosophic mind, nor attempts to explore the divinity. They were defenses offered against would-be understandings of the antinomies of divine revelation, which would undermine what the apostles had proclaimed about Christ and the salvation he had accomplished. Continuing in this pattern, the definition of faith adopted by the Council of Chalcedon rejected the Nestorian and Eutychian attempts to understand two natures in union with the four adverbs for which that statement is justly famous, unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. As Schmemann urged, quote, these words are all negative. What can human language say to the mystery of Christ's being? 
But this negative definition has an inexhaustible religious meaning. It guards, describes, and expresses forever what composes the very essence of Christianity, the joyous mystery of the gospel, end quote. The arguments that led to the Fifth Ecumenical Council, Constantinople II and 553, were, according to Schmemann, renewed attempts somehow, quote, to rationalize Christianity. That's what provoked and led to the council, this, end quote. With Schmemann, John Meyendorf emphasized in his remarkable work, Christ in Eastern Christian Thought, emphasized that the issues at stake for the church in the Christological controversies were soteriological at base. He urged that the struggle for precise words to avoid misunderstandings was, quote, of help in expressing, if not explaining, the mystery of redemption, end quote. In referring to Leo the Great's tome sent to the Council of Chalcedon, Meyendorf points out, quote, Leo's intention was not to speculate about the very meaning of the union of the two natures in Christ, but to reintroduce the common sense of the Bible in which Jesus appeared clearly as both God and man, end quote. And at the council, each of the bishops pre- present responded, quote, that Leo's, Leo's letter was, in his opinion, only a new expression of the true faith proclaimed at Nicaea, Constantinople, and Ephesus, end quote. It was not an addition to or attempt better to understand but another way of stating what had already been defended is the apostolic message. The result of the deliberations at, Constant- at, at Chalcedon with the four negative adverbs, quote, excluded any pretension to explain fully in human terms the very mystery of the incarnation, end quote. In his extended examination of the history of the Christological controversies, Meyendorf never, as an Orthodox scholar, spoke of any development of Christian teaching or progress from an earlier stage, apart from recognizing that more precise terms ended up being used to exclude misunderstandings. And this brings us then, finally, among these Orthodox scholars, to the most recent study of the controversies of the early church produced by John Baer. He boldly states that, quote, the orientation of much modern theology is construed in terms of the gradual development of a dogmatic edifice, end quote, in which the church father's concern with the apostolic tradition was sidelined in favor of other concerns, which Bear briefly describes. He forthrightly declares, this, to be blunt, is nothing short of the distortion of the gospel itself. End quote. As he sets forth his perspective on what was at issue in the ancient controversies, Bear avers that, quote, the aim of the theological project was to articulate in the face of perceived aberrations, the canon of truth as precisely as possible, constantly returning, as Polycarp urged his readers in the early 2nd century, to the word delivered to us from the beginning. End quote. That faithfully transmitted message was focused on salvation achieved through Christ. Bear continues, quote, There are two basic axioms that determine the, this model and the theological reflection of the ensuing centuries through the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The first is that only God can save. The second axiom is that only as a human being can God save human beings. Following through the logic of these two axioms leads inexorably to Chalcedon, end quote. That logic led not to attempts to analyze the being of Christ, but to reflection on and determination to defend the message of salvation. This entailed trying to find better terminology with which to set forth that message in the face of attempts to make sense of what had been revealed. Bear acknowledges, quote, certainly the formulae of doc- dogmatic theology are expressed more precisely in the fourth century than earlier in response to various questions newly raised, and they continue to be refined thereafter. But these formulae were not themselves the focal point of Christian faith. Rather, they expressed the parameters of the engagement with the scriptures in the contemplation and worship of Christ, end quote. After an intense analysis of the controversies as they were conducted and looking at the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed that was adopted, Bear comments, quote, Nicene theology does not presume to give an account of the inner life of God, end quote. That Nicene theology grew out of the church's worship, contemplation, and prayer, which arose as response to the apostolic proclamation of salvation in Christ. Bear concludes, quote, Nicene Orthodoxy is thus not a 4th century creation, as is often presented in treatments of the history of the development of doctrine, 
It is certainly a defining moment in the history of Christian theology, but it is so because it preserves the truth of the definitive revelation. End quote. Now, with some temerity, I add my voice to what the four Orthodox scholars have said. And it's something that has struck me over the last many years of studying and teaching these matters. Having considered what these four Orthodox scholars have urged, I would add a further observation, which I think is germane. It's important to note a particular phrase which appears in the Nicene or Constantinopolitan Creed and is repeated in the definition of faith of the Council of Chalcedon. Having professed the genuine deity of the Son of God, both immediately affirm, quote, who for us and for our salvation, end quote, before professing his incarnation and all he accomplished. This phrase was neither a sop tossed in the direction of pastoral types that, who needed something simpler to present to their flocks, nor merely a nod toward early emphases in the church. This phrase, who for us and for our salvation, goes to the heart of the controversies and why they arose. The aberrations condemned at the councils and repudiated in the conciliar statements have been te teachings that would have gutted the possibility for salvation. Each of them had been an attempt to figure out how the antinomies in the divine revelation could be eased. And they did so by focusing on what, what could make sense, figure it out so that we can understand it. But in each case, the result was neglect and distortion of the other component of that paradox, a genuine misunderstanding so damning that it would have made salvation impossible. With all this, is it easier to recognize what we have, what we have in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed and in Chalcedon's definition of faith? While they speak of the wonders of the Trinity and of Christology, they are not roadmaps for exploring the interior of God or of Christ. Rather, the, nice, the, the creed and the definition of faith are no trespassing signs. They proclaim the one who has accomplished salvation in Christ while warning of dangers to be turned away from. That's my addition to it. Now, fourthly, a proposed phrase. We've been looking at faith seeking what? We'll come to this one in a moment. To bring this all to an end and open up some time for discussion, we will return now briefly to the original question. Is there a phrase parallel to Western Christianity's fides quadens intellectum? Oops. Fides quadens intellectum that would capture an orthodox approach to dealing with the history of Christian doctrine. Fides quadens quid. If intellectum doesn't work, what might we say if we were to do it in Latin? As I pondered this in light of what can be found in orthodox treatments of that history, I considered a number of options, and among them, one that commended itself after some reflection was faith-seeking articulation, which I don't have up here. There's a good reason for that. Fides quadens articulaciona, that is, precise wordings, which would exclude error but present the apostolic tradition about God and salvation in Christ. As I considered that, though, I saw it would be inadequate for two reasons. One is that the, the Latin term articulatio was not articulation as we know it. It's used to describe connections between joints and tendons and ligaments, which isn't exactly the point I was getting at, even if articulation works in our day. But beyond that, facing articulation, uh, precise wordings, which would exclude error but present the apostolic tradition about God and salvation in Christ. But as I considered it, I saw it would be inadequate it would focus on the means, that is, the terms which came to be accepted, for speaking about what cannot be understood, rather than the end or the goal, responsibly and worshipfully naming the one God in three persons whom we worship as Savior in Christ. Upon more consider careful consideration, I came to faith-seeking boundaries. Faith-seeking boundaries that warned against trespassing into heretical territory and pointed responsibly to the God whom we worship. In Latin, that phrase, as you see, is fides quietens et definitionis. Now, the Latin term definitionis has a different meaning than our English term definition, though it has, uh, though there are other uh, connotations to it. Definitionis in Latin refers to fixed 
are marked boundaries. I think in that regard, Fides Quietens definitiones might be acceptable as a way to describe the orthodox approach to the history of Christian doctrine. And I thought that might work if you're looking for a Latin phrase to counter Fides Quietens intellectum. But then I'm encouraged to think this phrase might, be, might work given something that came only to me after I'd completed these ruminations. As a Western Christian scholar, to try to understand and get inside the mind and part of orthodoxy has been exciting for me. A lot of it's been enjoyable and stimulating. But I, as, as I was thinking about it, as I sat with Fides Quietens Definitionis, I thought that would work. I stumbled anew upon the term used by the ecumenical councils to describe their declarations at Constantinople in 381 at Chalcedon in 451, and in Nicaea in 787, each of these de- conciliar definitions was styled a horos, a Greek term used for a fixed or marked boundary. Ah, the irony of historical research. I have laboriously discovered what lay at hand had I looked there. Even so, I hope the phrase may be useful to describe how orthodox scholarship approaches the history of Christian doctrine. Thank you for your attention.